Red one with the green ribbon and the green one with the red ribbon and the blue one with silver and the white one with gold. It's not what happens, it's how you handle it. You are in a water bubble human body on a private jet in seemingly a god world a glass of champagne, a certain luminosity and clarity, skin of air, a flat sea of white clouds below, a vast dome of blue sky above, and your mind is an iron nail in between. It's not what happens, it's how you handle it. Dead cat bounce, catch a falling knife. After endless shadow boxing in your sleep, fighting in your dreams and knocking yourself out, you realize everything is empty and appears as miraculous display. All are in nature, the play of emptiness and clarity. Everyone gets lighter, everyone gets lighter, everyone gets lighter, everyone is light. And this next poem is called Just Say No to Family Values. <laughs> On a day when you're walking down the street and you see a hearse with a coffin followed by a flower, car, and limos, you know the day is auspicious. Your plans are going to be successful. But on a day when you see a bride and groom and wedding party, watch out. Be careful, it might be a bad sign. Just say no to family values and don't quit your day job. Drugs are sacred substances and some drugs are very sacred substances. Please praise them for somewhat liberating the mind. Tobacco is a sacred substance to some. And even though you stopped smoking, show a little respect. <laughs> Alcohol is totally great. Let us celebrate the glorious qualities of booze. And I had a good time being with you. Just do it, just do it. Just don't not do it, do it. Christian fundamentalists fundamentalistic catology and fundamentalists in general are viruses and they're killing us, multiplying and mutating and they're destroying us. Now you know you gotta give strong medicine to combat a virus. <laughs> Who's buying? Good acid, I'm flying, slipping and sliding, slurping and slamming. I'm sinking, dipping and dripping and squirting inside you. Never fast forward a cum shot. Milk, milk, lemonade, round the corner where the chocolate's made. I love to see your face when you're suffering. Do it with anybody you want, whatever you want, for as long as you want, any time, any place, when it's possible, and try to be safe in a situation where you must abandon <laughs> yourself beyond all concepts. Just say no to family values. We don't got to say no to family values. We never think about them. Just do it. Just make love and uh, compassion. <laughs> excerpts from a long memoir piece that's called The Death 
of William Burroughs. William died on August 2nd, 1997, Saturday at 6.30 in the afternoon from complications from a massive heart attack he had had the day before. He was 83 years old. I was with William Burroughs when he died, and it was one of the best times I ever had with him. Doing Tibetan Nyingma Buddhist meditation practices, I absorbed his consciousness into my heart. It seemed like a bright white light, blinding but muted. I was the vehicle, his consciousness passing through me. A gentle shooting star came in my heart and up the central channel and out the top of my head to a pure field of great clarity and bliss. It was very powerful. William Burroughs resting in great meditation, great equanimity, and the vast, empty expanse of primordial wisdom mind. I was staying in William's house, doing my meditation practices for him, trying to maintain the good conditions and dissolve any obstacles that might be arising for him at that very moment in the bardo. I had confidence that William had a high degree of realization, but he was not totally, not completely an enlightened being. Lazy, alcoholic, junky William. I did not allow doubt to arise in my mind, even for an instant, because it would have allowed doubt to arise in William's mind. Now I had to do it for him. Another part of this piece is called uh, What Went In to William Burroughs' Coffin with His Dead Body. On Tuesday morning, August 6, 1997, James Grauerholz and Ira Silverberg came to William's house to pick out the clothes for the funeral director to put on William's dead body. The clothes were in a closet in my room, and we picked out the things that would go into William's coffin and grave, accompanying him on his journey in the underworld. His favorite gun, a 38 snub nose special, fully loaded with five shots. William called it the snubby. The gun was my idea. William always said, you can never be too well armed in any situation. Of his more than 80 world-class guns, he often wore it on his belt during the day and slept with it, fully loaded on his right side under the bedsheet every night for 15 years. Gray fedora, he always wore a hat when he went out and we wanted his consciousness to feel at ease dead. His favorite cane, a sword cane, made of hickory with a light rosewood finish. A sport jacket, black with a dark green tint. We rummaged through his closet and it was the best of his shabby clothes and smelling sweet of him. Blue jeans, the least worn ones, were the only ones clean. Red bandana, he sometimes kept one in a back pocket. Jockey underwear and socks. Black shoes, the ones he wore when he performed. I thought the old brown ones that he wore every day because they were more comfortable. But James Grauerholz insisted. There's an old CIA slang that says getting a new assignment is getting new shoes. White shirt. We bought it in a men's shop in Beverly Hills in 1981 on the rent 
night tour. It was his best shirt. All the others were a bit ragged. And even though it had become tight, we thought it would fit. He'd lost a lot of weight, and we thought it would fit. Necktie, blue, hand painted by William. Moroccan vest, green velvet with a gold brocade trim, given him by Brian Geisen 25 years before. In his lapel buttonhole, the rosette of the French government's commandeur des arts et lettres, and the rosette of the American Academy of Arts and Letters, honors which William very much appreciated. A gold coin in his pants pocket, a gold 19th century Indian head five dollar piece symbolizing all wealth. He would have enough money to buy his way in the underworld. His eyeglasses in his outside jacket pocket, a ballpoint pen, the kind he always used. He was a writer and sometimes wrote longhand. A joint of really good grass. Junk, just before the funeral, Grant Hart slipped a small white paper packet into William's pocket. Nobody's gonna bust him, said Grant. William, bejeweled with all his adornments, was traveling in the underworld. I kissed him, an early LP album of Us Together, 1974, was called Biting Off the Tongue of a Corpse. I kissed him on the lips, but I didn't do it, and I should have. <laughs> That's it. This next poem is called It Doesn't Get Better. It doesn't get better. It doesn't get better. It doesn't get any better. It doesn't get any better than this. It doesn't get any more fabulous. And as bad as it is, it does not get any better. Stuck in a traffic jam and the scenery is beautiful, irritating gusts of boredom, and on the radio is playing. If you don't like my oceans, don't swim in my seas. You can't hurt me, cause storms can't hurt the sky. Sugar skulls and long necklaces of rotting human skulls, of police officers, lawyers, and judges, the triumph over abuse and injustice, fat chance. Ring the, the alarm. I could not save you. You are addicted to anger and complaining. When you got hepatitis, everything looks yellow. My anger ate the goose that laid the golden eggs, thick bacon, and a little something sweet. And the most surprising change is being the god of your enemies. The eagles fly below us. The illusion that makes life bearable, the illusion that makes life bearable, the illusion that makes life bearable, when you lose the illusion that makes life bearable, when you lose the illusion that makes life bearable, when you've lost whatever it is you believed or invented or imprinted or scarred by unthinkable loss, delusion inside delusion inside delusion. Everything is delusion, including wisdom. 
And then there's the illusions that make life bearable. The illusions that make life bearable. The illusions that make life bearable. I'm here to do whatever is your pleasure. Empty words gone without a trace. All I had to do was get through it. All I had to do was get through it. All I had to do was get through it. You can't win. You can't break even. And you can't even quit the game. And happily, very soon, I will remember nothing. The sand is snow. A hurricane in a drop of cum. You will find your true love in the end. You will find your true love in the end. When you die, you will find your true love in your mind. When you die, you will find your true mind. In the darkest night is the brightest light, clear, unlocatable, emptiness awareness. Okay, so next I'm going to read a new piece. It's a, it's a memoir piece about Frederico Garcia Lorca, and it takes place in 1954, the memoir piece. And I've written it, I'm going to perform it in New York on June 5th, at the, there's a Frederico Garcia Lorca exhibition of Poet in New York, all the manuscripts, they had a great exhibition and uh, that opened last month. And so on June 4th, I performed this piece in New York. And it's, And it's called, Lorca, Please Help Me. I was 17 years old and had just begun my freshman year at Columbia College in New York. About two weeks after I arrived on September 14, 1954, Tuesday in the early evening, I was sitting in my room on a green leather chair doing homework reading for the Humanities Core Curriculum class tomorrow. I was looking out the window from the eighth floor of Livingston Hall at the view over the quadrangle, the classic Georgian buildings designed in 1893 by Sanford White, who created a master plan in the grand style of great palaces, beautiful trees, and English landscaping, and the broad green south field. It was warm and balmy, hazy, a sylvan glade, and a vivid rose-gray sunset heavenly smack in the middle of New York City. It also seemed like a joke. A young man in an ideal situation reading Plato and the classics. On the surface it was ide idyllic, but beneath I was filled with anxiety, foreboding, and doubt. I was reading, had a hangover, and a depression problem. There was a loud knock on the door, and John Kaiser, a new friend who was also majoring in literature, came in and visited. I just learned the most amazing bit of information, said John, a monumental fact. Frederico Garcia Lorca lived here. What? I had no idea what he was talking about. Garcia Lorca lived in John J. Hall. What? I was completely taken by surprise, and I hadn't thought about Garcia Lorca in a long time. When? In 1929 and 1930, said John, and he wrote Poet in New York, his greatest work here. This is 1954, 25 years ago, I said. When you're 17, 
25 years seems like ancient history. I remembered Lorca had traveled to Cuba and came to New York, and he was gay and I was gay. Lorca did not live in a dormitory room in John Jay. I don't believe it. It's true, he lives here. For one night, by mistake, because he couldn't find a hotel. For two years, said John. In what room? In room on the 12th floor of John Jay, room 1231. It's not possible, I said. Garcia Lorca did not live in a dormitory. It was very confusing. I did not want Lorca living in my dumb, middle-class, bourgeois, fucked-up world. He would hate it. It would be horrible for him and cause him suffering. Anything but this. What room? Room 1231. John and I rushed to the window and leaned out on our, with our elbows on the broad granite ledge and looked to the left at John J. Hall. <gasps> oh no, I know those rooms, I said. I know someone in room 1225. They're all tiny, single rooms like prison cells. We gazed in astonishment at the red brick building speckled with lighted windows. I counted up to the 12th floor and across the windows. It's that one, the one there with no lights. Ah, it, that's it, said John. This is so weird, Garcia Lorca. The 12th floor of John Jay was almost on the same level as the 8th floor of our building. Lorca saw what we see. John Kaiser seemed deeply moved and was having a small but profound experience. I had a funny feeling, a strange feeling, when I learned Lorca lived here. What did he do when he lived here, I said? Read books, sleep, have friends, have sex. Dormitory life is so boring. Lorca slept alone in a single bed every night like me. Gar Garcia Lorca chose to live in this stifling, straight, academic world from which I only wanted to escape. His greatest poems could not have been written here, but they, he did and they were, said John. It was very exciting. Lorca brought guys to that room and had sex, I said. John Kaiser, who was straight, chuckled happily. Yes, Lorca picked up guys and fucked in that room. I'm gay and that's what I do here. It was pretty astonishing. It's extraordinary, said John. It changes the way I feel about being here, going to school here. Room 1231 is a sacred place, I said, like Bethlehem or Bodh Gaya. We should do a pilgrimage. Knock on the door and sniff with our eyes and hearts. Let's do it, yes, let's do it, said John. I would even go as far as making it with the guy whose room it is, just to make it where Lorca made it. The bed must be in the same place. Yes, you should do it, said John. I thought but did not say to fuck with a guy and come in the exact same place where Lorca fucked with a guy and came was some kind of blessing, no matter how distant and faint, two minds mixed in one taste beyond death. And I said, the desk and chair must be in the same place, they're, although they've probably been replaced, updated. Lorca sat in the exact same spot and wrote his greatest poems, Poet in New York. It seemed a blessing beyond comprehension in a place which for me was a stifling, dead prison, my hell world. I also saw it reluctantly as a teacher. Great poems of great wisdom are written anywhere, and if I was going to do it, I had to do it here. Suddenly came 
the unknown distant 1936 memory of Lorca's betrayal. He shouldn't be here. Get Lorca out of here. He will become defiled and suffer. He is a god of poetry. Night fell quickly. John left and I sat in on the green leather chair in the dark near the windows, not looking at Lorca's room, nor the lamp-lit sparkling campus, just letting my mind rest with my eyes open. I started crying, weeping big fat tears, a flood of water with muscle convulsions and wind gusts of despair. I was here and did not want to be here. I was a poet, and why? What was I supposed to do? I was at the beginning of my life, and if I had to endure a lifetime of this, oh no, a fate worse than death, in a flood of tears, from an unlocatable place in my heart. Wait, I lost my place. <laughs> a fate worse than death. In a flood of tears from an unlocatable place in my mind, and it surprised me, came a primal scream. Lorca, please help me. Lorca, please help me. Even though it was early, I went to bed and sleep to forget about it completely, dissolving it into nothing in a deep, heavy sleep of exhaustion and oblivion. And the next morning, everything was okay. And it can, it, this is pieces in two parts. And the next part goes, about four months later, when I was 18 years old, in January 1955, about five in the afternoon, I came up from having a beer in the Boar's Head Tavern in the basement of John J. Hall. I ran into John Kaiser and some friends in the lobby, near the elevators. We stood there talking. Have you gone up to Lorca's room, said John softly. What? It was noisy, and I didn't know what he was talking about. Have you gone up to Garcia Lorca's room, said John loud and clearly. No, I was taken by surprise again, and had forgotten again about Lorca. Have you? John pushed the elevator button. Let's go. I was a bit shocked that he had done such an aggressive thing, and I reluctantly got in the elevator. I was not prepared for Garcia Lorca, and being bratty, I did not want to be. I became the straight guy, being forced to do some disgusting sexual thing with the <laughs> sexual thing with a fag. My second thought was, John, what a great idea! Thanks. We got out on the 12th floor, turned left, and John led the way to room 1231. We stood there in the dim light of the tan-colored, grungy corridor and looked at the dark, stained pine door and the metal tag 1231. This was the door to Lorca's room. Eyes open, no thoughts, fearlessly I reached out and knocked gently three times. In the ringing silence, there was no answer. I could feel John's expectation next to me. I knocked three more times more strongly. Nobody's here, nope. I knocked loudly a third time. He's not home, said John. Well, he is, and the guy isn't. We laughed. It's great. It's so dumb. We stood in front of Garcia's locker's room from the 1920s. The dark brown, almost black, door frame, painted many coats of brown, 
shabby, surprisingly shabby. Happily, the door was a black pool of cold, heavy water. I worried it was a bad sign, an omen. I did not let on, acted happy, cheerful, and funny. It's worse than I thought, which helped suppress the tears and overwhelming sadness. Poeta on Nueva York, said John in a deep bass, unrecognizable voice. The scene was both corny and profound. The cliché metaphor of the door, the unknown, unseeable God emptiness, and a black door in a locker play, behind which sadness screamed in silence. Let's go, said John. We walked, we left, and I walked away on wobbly legs down the dim corridor with a headache and an echo in my mind. Lorca, please help me. Lorca, please help me. Uh, this next part is called There Was a Bad Tree. There was a bad tree, a bad tree the people hated. The leaves gave off a foul smell, and the flowers had a bitter stink. If you got too close, you vomited. The fruit was poison. One bite and you were dead. Everyone really disliked it. The bad tree stunk. They talked endlessly about it and decided to cut it down. Get rid of it. They chopped with axes and barely made a dent. Wearing breathing masks, they whacked at it and whacked at it and nibbled and chipped oily powder from the shiny dark green leaves got on their skin, blistered and was really itchy and they scratched bloody red. They put on protective gear with oxygen and went at it with electric buzz saws and heavy equipment. Working 24 hour shifts, finally they cut it down. Everybody was very happy and celebrated the great victory, a noble deed well done. And they went to bed exhausted. The next day, the bad tree had grown up, had sprung up new and bigger and more beautiful and ugly. It was very depressing. They talked a lot about it and cut it down again and poured gasoline on the roots and burned all the leaves and branches in a big fire. After the smolder, embers got cold, the tree grew back, bigger, more bad, and really gorgeous. Other people had been waiting from their houses, waiting their turn. They thought themselves smarter with higher intellectual capabilities. They knew how to get rid of the tree. It was a growing plant, a wood tree that grew in the earth. They incinerated it, burned the roots with chemicals, vaporizing acids and robotic lasers, detonated on the ground, bombed from the air, hit with smart missiles, and bombarded with radiation. They made a fire storm and covered the ground with concrete and steel. The tree grew back, more fresh, more elegant, even gracious, and really ugly. The wood was harder, thick, hot muscle, and the leaves, full and lush, moved like underwater plants luxuriously in the breeze. 
It was extremely depressing, extremely a catastrophe. They had made for themselves a hell world. They talked incessantly about it and came to a big decision. The mayor resigned in disgrace, and those who had worked so hard left, humiliated, departed, moved to the other side of town, stayed away. Then, out of the blue, appeared these beautiful people. They were simple and humble, and a little like peacocks, and seemingly well-intentioned with a great sense of humor, radiantly relaxed, oozing loving kindness and compassion, they walked right up and started eating the leaves. They ate the leaves and enjoyed them, became happy, laughed and laughed, and chomped on more leaves. You could tell they really liked the taste. They pressed their cheeks to the flowers, black velvet coated with transmission oil. They licked the sweet juices that seeped from the petals. The pollen was coal dust and petroleum gas. Burying their noses, they sucked in deep breaths, eating the smell. Great bliss. They discovered the fruit hidden beneath the leaves, overripe mangoes with sticky eggplant skin hung like testicles. And inside the meat was rotting, beside the fruit was rotting meat. The special people got, they licked and drank the thick red juice. The seeds, like carbouchon rubies, seemed particularly potent and were chewed with great delight. The fruit contained the five wisdoms. The men and women became luminous. Their skin was golden and their bodies, almost transparent, were clothed in shimmering rainbow lights. They became sleepy yawned and curled up under the tree and took a nap. While they slept, music filled the air. Lounging against the gnarled tree trunk and protruding roots, their huge bodies, colored red, yellow, blue, green, white, rested in great equanimity and radiated huge compassion. Inside the tree was the secret home of many demigods, hungry ghosts, and earth spirits who were very pleased with all the positive attention being paid them. After years of abuse, mutilation, and destruction, they were thrilled even though they were being ravaged and their flowers wrecked. At the root endings, there were jewels, diamonds and emeralds and rubies, which were stars in the sky of the world below. The beautiful men and women woke up and nibbled on the leaves again. They ate the leaves like deer, pausing between bites, looking up at the vast, empty sky. The leaves and fruit increased their clarity and bliss and introduced the nature of primordially pure wisdom mind. My 70th birthday in December of 2006, thanks for nothing on my 70th birthday. I want to give my thanks to everyone for everything. And as a token of my appreciation, I want to offer back to you all my good and bad habits as magnificent, priceless jewels. Wish 
fulfilling gems, satisfying your every need and want. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thanks. May every drug I ever took come back and get you high. May every glass of wine and vodka I ever drank come back and make you feel really good, numbing your nerve ends, allowing the natural clarity of your mind to flow free. May all the suicides be songs of aspiration. Thanks that bad news is always true. May all the chocolate I've ever eaten come back rushing through your bloodstream and make you feel happy. Thanks for allowing me to be a poet, a noble effort doomed but the only choice. I want to thank you for your kindness and praise. Thanks for celebrating me. Thanks for the resounding applause. Thanks for taking everything for yourself and giving nothing back. You were always only self-serving. Thanks for exploiting my big ego and making me a star for your own benefit. Thanks that you never paid me. Thanks for all the sleaze. Thanks for being mean and rude and smiling at my face. I am happy that you robbed me. I am happy that you lied. I am happy that you helped me. Thanks. Grazie. Merci beaucoup. May you smoke a joint with William and spend some intimate time with his mind, more profound than any book he wrote. I give enormous thanks to all my lovers, beautiful men with brilliant minds, Bob, Jasper, Ugo. May they come here and make love to you. And may my many other lovers of totally great sex, countless lovers of boundless, fabulous sex, countless lovers of boundless, fabulous sex, countless lovers of boundless, fabulous sex in the golden age of promiscuity, may they all come here and make love to you if you want. May they hold you in their arms, ball into your heart's delight, ball into your heart's delight, ball into your heart's delight. May all the people who are dead, Alan, Brian, Cookie, Jack, and I do not miss any of you, I don't miss any of them, no nostalgia, it was wonderful that we loved each other, but I do not want any of them back. Now, if any of you are attracted to any of them, may they come back from the dead and do whatever is your pleasure. May they multiply and be the slaves of whomever wants them, satisfying your every wish and desire. But you won't want them as masters, as their demons. May Andy come here, fall in love with you, and make each of you a superstar. Everyone can have Andy, everyone can have Andy, everyone can have Andy, everyone can have an Andy. Huge hugs to my friends who betrayed me. Every friend became an enemy sooner or later. Deep kisses to my loves that failed. I am delighted you are vacuum cleaners sucking everything into your dirt bag. You are none other than a reflection of my mind. Thanks for the depression problem and feeling like suicide every day of my life. And now, 
that I'm 76. <laughs> I'm happily almost there. 20 billion years ago, in the primordial wisdom soup beyond comprehension and indescribable, something without substance moved slightly and became something imperceptible, moved again and became invisible, moved again and became a particle, and particles moved again and became a cork, and again and became quarks, moved again and again and became protons and neutrons, and the 12 dimensions of space, tiny fireballs of primordial energy bits tossed back and forth in a game of catch between particles, transmitting electromagnetic light and going really fast, 40 million times a second, where the pebble hits the water. This is where the trouble began. Something without substance became something with substance. Why did this happen? Because something substance-less had a feeling of missing out on something, not getting it, not getting it, not getting something when there was nothing to have. From that primordially endless potential to modern day reality, 20 billion years later, has produced me and my stupid grasping mind has made me and you and my grasping mind. May Rinpoche and all the great Tibetan teachers who loved me come back and love you more. May they hold you in their wisdom hearts, bathe you in all pervasive compassion, give you pith instructions, and may you, with the diligence of Olympic athletes, do meditation, practice, and may you, with great confidence, realize the true nature of mind. America thanks for the neglect. I did it without you. Let us celebrate poetic justice. You and I never were, never tried to do anything, and never succeeded. Thanks for introducing me to the face of the naked mind. Thanks for nothing. <laughs>